going to be talking about metastatic breast cancer in specific, but before I get started, we're going to have the bulk of our time I'd like to spend on questions and answers, things that you want to know about breast cancer, in particular metastatic breast cancer. Hopefully I can answer them. If not, I'll be honest and say I can't answer them. But uh, this really should be interactive. Um, when we, when we get through all these slides, I really want us to learn together because as a physician, I learn from my patients just as much as they should be learning from me in the best treatments for them. And one size doesn't fit all, and we have to be cognizant of doctors and be humble with our patients, especially when dealing with such tenuous diseases uh, throughout their lives, and so they can interact and be healthy and happy. So this is about metastatic breast cancer. Uh, just the definition, metastatic in general means a cancer that has spread from one part of the body to a different part of the body in the breast, meaning it's spread from the breast to any other part of the body. It could be the liver, the lungs, the thyroid glands, the bones, the adrenals, um, really any other part of the body. When it spreads to an area called the axilla, that's the <coughs> underarm, um, it's actually not called metastatic, that's locally advanced breast cancer, and in staging a breast cancer that would be considered either stage two or three of breast cancer. So when we say metastatic, that sometimes can mean stage four breast cancer, and breast cancer is stage one through four, or we can call it advanced breast cancer. And these are all the same terms um, for something called metastatic breast cancer. So this is a very important thing, and you know, before I came in today, uh, I saw all the people that I work with and work with closely um, in the social work department, um, through Mama Medical Center, and through um, the cancer care support community. I think it's important that we have a great support team, and not just great oncologists, we need great uh, people who can address patients' needs, and those needs are so vast that it is impossible for a doctor really to address them in a visit. Those needs go from transportation needs, to psychosocial needs, to meals on wheels, to setting up nursing staff, to really going through the gamut of everyone's needs. So when you choose a team, you don't just choose a doctor, you choose a center that actually can provide and serve your needs. And at Monmouth Medical Center, and just the, through the Barnabas system, we are really partnering with our patients um, we actually, these lectures that we give through the, uh, the wellness community and we give other educational lectures throughout the year are really to partner with the community to let them know we're here for them and we're willing and want to help them out of the community. So I want to first of all thank all my social workers and the department at Monmouth for doing a great job in reaching out to the patients and also thank my nurses for um, really reaching out and going those extra miles for our patients. So we're going to go through each of these pointers briefly, choose a health care team that has expertise in treating diseases. A lot of centers have breast cancer centers, Monmouth Medical Center through the Lens Center, um, through our screening programs, really have a fabulous center set up both through nurses, navigation, uh, through our navigation system to help usher and help uh, patients through the system. We have surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists. I mean, we have every single need that would be uh, necessary for patients. We also have clinical trials available for our patients through the Robert Johnson Rutgers Cancer Network. To me, this is kind of the most important thing. I mean, anyone can meet any doctor, anyone can go to a cancer center, but everyone needs to have communication. You need to be heard, you need to actually express. My patients who are somewhere here know that they all have my cell phone numbers and they use it. And to be honest with you, if you knew how busy my day was, I can tell you that I have typically one or two patients in the hospital, not 10, 15, 20 patients in the hospital. That's because when you communicate with your patients, you can actually really prophylactically and get ahead of these patients to try to prevent an infection, prevent a admission to the hospital, do it as an outpatient rather than really impairing your quality of life and being admitted to the hospital. So I think communication is really essential for a patient to have. They need access to their doctors, access to their offices, the nurses, to be able to get in touch with the doctors. 
unfortunately on a moment's notice because it can make a difference for some patients you know whether you they can reach you within two minutes or within an hour or two hours so communication is really my hallmark of treating and my paradigm for treating patients obviously geography is important where you live insurance unfortunately is a reality in our society uh, without getting political and uh, mm -hmm. urgent care needs uh, need to be addressed so the second opinions are always strongly encouraged we have and we're starting through once again our network of uh, partnering with Rutgers and Robert Johnson of getting uh, what's called telemedicine second opinions and we're starting that so our patients don't have to travel up to Rutgers for an opinion they can actually go to a monitor and screen and actually on the TV interface with the doctor for a telemedicine second opinion with all the information provided to them. But I think second opinions are vital. I think it's vital to coordinate with your current and your treating doctor uh, where you should go for your second opinion and what suits your personality best. So it's always important to keep a list of uh, questions and you should bring. I tell my patients after they leave the office, it'd be great if everyone has a, has a little book and they can write down questions so when they come back, they don't have to feel flustered and say, you know, I had a bunch of things to ask you, Dr. Cohen, but I forgot what they are. That's a question that I can't answer. <laughs> but if you write down a list of questions, the truth is you could write down in a little notebook and write down a list of questions. I would almost tell my patients, why don't you just call me if you have a question that seems maybe insignificant to you, but maybe you could have a huge impact on your anxiety and how you're going to navigate the next few days, weeks, months in terms of treatment. Uh, I think it's always great to bring a friend or a relative to an appointment because I find that when you tell a patient one set of data and information, sometimes the patient thinks they heard something totally different. And it's important to corroborate that with a friend and make sure that that friend knows that, uh, you know, what, what the doctor says. And once again, it's, work, it's important to work with your doctor, discussing what your expectations are, really what you want out of life. Everyone has different goals to their treatment. Some patients might say, I just want to have a good quality of life, and I'm in pain, and that's all I want is quality. Other patients will say, well, I want to be, live longer. Other patients might say, I want to live longer with a quality of life. Other patients will say, just make me as comfortable as possible, you know, for as long as I have. And the doctors don't know what your expectations are. So it's very vital in the initial appointment and even after the initial appointment is to set the expectations for what you want out of life, not what the doctor tells you you should want out of your, your treatment. I think it's also important in the, in the age of complementary medicine to discuss um, vitamins, herbs that you're on, these do have an influence on it. We can also, at the end of this lecture, I gave a few months ago a lecture on uh, marijuana and CBD oil, and I think it's great stuff that people should experiment with. Um, I have no problems with it. I'm not sure why everyone asks if I'm against it. I just, I just personally don't prescribe it for my patients and not for the reason that I don't believe in it. I don't prescribe it for my patients because that is a whole another half an hour of conversation during the office visit. And I'm trying to focus on one aspect, which is their cancer care, not on attainment of marijuana. If you want marijuana, there are plenty of places in the area that you can get it. I think if you make a right or two left, the guy selling some stuff. There's a lot of my mother told me. <laughs> but, but I'm not, a, no doctor really is opposed to marijuana. These are all measures to actually help the patients get through this trying time. So if you use marijuana, for instance, for nausea or vomiting, that's purely acceptable. If you use marijuana for pain control, and if you think it helps your pain, that's fine. Obviously, you have to be careful of where you buy it from, and you want to buy it from a source that's pure. You don't want to end up in a hospital because it was laced with something else. Um, but, you know, there is, the state of New Jersey actually has legal marijuana for medical use, and there are plenty of practitioners in the state that you can get it from. It does take time because you have to apply online, and you have to find a practitioner that does it, so there are plenty of practitioners that can do it. <coughs> Thank you.
Okay, so let's discuss for a few moments how treatment for metastatic breast cancer is different from early treatment. Early stage breast cancer is what we call adjuvant therapy. I'm going to use these terms different from metastatic breast cancer treatment. So when you're treating someone for early stage breast cancer, we call it adjuvant, meaning in addition to, for instance, their surgery or their radiation that they're going to have. Um, adjuvant breast cancer is typically based, and for patients who get it, for patients who have early stage breast cancer, i.e. it has not spread to any other part of the body. It has not spread to the liver, it has not spread to the lungs, it is localized either to the breast or to the lymph nodes. When you're treating metastatic breast cancer, you're trying to manage a few things here. You're trying to manage the symptoms, you're trying to maintain everyday functioning, you're trying to do both of these, and these are the most important things to me. At the same time as maintaining someone's quality of life, you're also trying to extend their life. No one knows, and I do not know, patients, and I have patients that have metastatic breast cancer that actually are stable and doing great, and I have patients who have metastatic breast cancer who are struggling. And it's a, the same disease, because we're calling it the same, we're calling it metastatic breast cancer. But in the same disease, you can have such a variety of uh, patients and different experiences. The goal is to slow down disease, stop disease, and really the goal is to maintain quality of life, extend life, and really live life. Okay, so if anyone in the audience has breast cancer, they should have at least heard some of these terms before, and if they didn't, they should start learning these terms. These are important terms that the doctor is gonna to refer to throughout their appointment. So what's called PR, or estrogen receptor positivity, PR, which is progesterone receptor positivity, HER2 positivity, or something called triple negative, which triple negative basically means ER, PR, and HER2, those three genes, which is negative. So those are very important because each of those types of either ER, PR, and HER2 new and triple negative determine a lot of times the therapy that the, doc the doctor will give you. And I always call this an address, meaning you can have a patient with X breast cancer that has ER positivity and HER2 positivity and they'll get treated with one set of therapies. And you can have a patient with what's called triple negative breast cancer, they'll be treated with a different set of chemotherapies or oral medications. And you can have 15, 20 people in your waiting room and they can all be on different treatments because you're basically targeting the therapy differently in order to slow down or stop the cancer. So this is why treatment varies from one patient to another. There's another test, I'm not sure if we have it in this slide, called oncotype. That's for early stage breast cancer. That is not for metastatic breast cancer. That is not for HER2 positive breast cancer. That's for patients who have stage one or two or three breast cancer, meaning it's spread from their lymph, spread either to their lymph nodes or it's at least 0.5 centimeter mass in the breast. So either a stage 1B or above breast cancer, that the oncotype is only given for ER positive patients and HER2 negative patients. So either your ER positive and HER2 negative, and an oncotype for adjuvant therapy is given which determines whether you need chemotherapy or not. So we're going to discuss a little later some molecular testing and things like that, but that's a little introduction to it. In addition, you want to know what are the short and long-term side effects of treatment, how do you know if the treatment is working, what are the supportive services that are available to you. This is an important one to me for patients. Who, who wants a bill at the end of the therapy and that they can't afford. And it's very important that we as a practice always get our patients cleared for the chemotherapy prior to starting the drugs. Are they eligible for clinical trials and what clinical trials are they eligible for? Okay, so we're gonna discuss some of these treatments. Hormonal treatments has to do with whether you're estrogen receptor positive or progesterone receptor positive for that matter. And those are drugs like Samara, Tamoxifen, Aromacin, Arimidex. Chemotherapy are the IV drugs typically, but there's an oral drug called Zolota. There's targeted therapy, which primarily goes with the HER2-new positive drugs. 
And there's immunotherapy, which is, there's only one drug uh, currently FDA approved called Tocentric for triple negative metastatic breast cancer in the current time. Sometimes a local treatment such as surgery or radiation can be treated for pain. So in a metastatic setting, meaning when a cancer has spread to another part of the body, we typically do not offer radiation to those patients. However, if a patient has pain, for instance, in their back, that is a disease, meaning the cancer has spread to the bones and is causing pain in the bones, those are the times we'll use radiation to palliate or soothe or lessen those symptoms from their breast cancer. Treatment will be based on severity of symptoms, location of disease, age, health status, personal goals, and these are the biomarkers we just talked about. The BRCA testing and any other genetic testing should be offered to patients. There are uh, algorithms we use for younger patients to see who should get testing and who should not get tested. Okay, everyone look at this slide quickly. Now we'll quiz everyone on it. You ready? We'll play a game. This is table A. You have to know those answers. The B and the C. We'll see how everyone does. All right, let's go through this uh, together. So if you're estrogen receptor positive, hormone therapies are actually right up the alley. So patients who present with hormone receptor positive, which is called estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, then a hormone therapy is one of the drugs we will use. We can also use a targeted therapy for hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So, for instance, a patient who presents with metastatic disease may start out with a drug like aromacin or Faslinex, which is an injection, and a target therapy called Virginio or Ibrax, if you don't watch TV, I think I see an Ibrax commercial every seven seconds. Uh, and a target therapy called Virginio or uh, Virginio or um, Ibrax, which is called a CDK inhibitor. Those actually work in conjunction with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Patients who are estrogen receptor positive also can go on chemotherapy. We'll go through the standard drugs for that. And then, of course, everyone can go through clinical trials. We're going to leave clinical trials really across the board, and everyone can get chemotherapy, which we'll discuss in a minute. If you're HER2 new positive, then you can get hormone therapy, which is the same as before, or targeted therapy, which will consist of drugs like Herceptin, Lipatinib, Pergetta, Ketsyla. So those are the targeted therapies, and we use them in different fashions in different ways, um, in terms of patients who have either progression of their disease on her 2 positive disease. Once again, if you're up here negative, that means hormonal therapy will not be applicable to you, meaning you're missing the target, and therefore giving the medication will be of, of little consequence or help. And therefore, if you're HER2 new positive, your salvage and your targeted therapy now becomes that HER2 new gene that you're gonna target with drugs like Progena, Herceptin, and Xylem, and Triple negative. So triple negative, the reason why triple negative breast cancers are difficult is they tend to be somewhat more aggressive. Hormone therapy you cannot get, this is no target to them. Targeted therapies, i.e. HER2 new, directed therapies, you cannot get because they're not, there's no target to hit. So uh, this past February, uh, the Centric was actually finally FDA approved for patients with triple negative breast cancer. And it works in, in a subset of patients. The problem with, with these patients is that it doesn't work in all of them, but it's worth a shot. And then you have ERPR, HER2 negative, once again triple negative, breast cancers which are, who are BRCA positive and there are FDA approved drugs for drugs that are uh, like lipatinib, which is uh, drugs for patients who are BRCA positive. Once again, chemotherapy and clinical trials. So you can see from this chart that if you're ER positive, hormone therapies is useful. If you're HER2 new positive, targeted therapies are useful. And if you are triple negative, then immunotherapies are currently the only FDA approved. Yes? So 
both for the initial incidents and for the static? Correct. <coughs> a little more complicated for that now. So this chart is really specifically for <coughs> metastatic breast cancer. If you have what's called early stage breast cancer, meaning adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant breast cancer that you need treatment, you will start with a chemotherapy and then go into a hormonal therapy. <coughs> meaning you'll start with medications to increase <coughs> chemotherapies initially and then post either the chemotherapy or the radiation therapy, you will go on to a hormonal therapy for either five years or 10 years or 15 years, whatever the negotiation, wherever the negotiation goes. So it's a little different. This chart is more designed for metastatic breast cancer, but yes, if you're ER positive, at some point in your therapy, you should be getting a hormonal agent, an oral agent. And if you're HER2 positive, you should be getting a target therapy, drugs like Perceptin, Progena, Casile. Okay, so these are some of the drugs. We just talked about them. This is, there are two classes of drugs. Yes? Question. If you're BRCA positive, does that have any bearing on being um, ER or PR or two? Typically not, but the truth is the profile of BRCA positives is a triple negative profile. <coughs> Meaning patients, see, I made an announcement. Please text me, my patients. <laughs> so she did. Uh, but typically, patients who are BRCA positive, their profile is a triple negative profile. That's sort of the. So when you see a, I have like a 28 year old young girl in my practice who presented with triple negative breast cancer, I knew she was BRCA positive, like before we even did the test. So it's, it, go, it sort of walks How? along. How? How? How did you know? Her mother had breast cancer, and she was triple negative. Yeah. It's a little, okay. Yeah, Appreciate that's for the whole story. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I've got nothing going on. What would I be if I throw all my cards? Does everyone take a test to see if they're BRCA positive? No. No, um, Myriad has what's called Myriad Table to see what your risk would be related to if you have any relatives, so it depends on your origin. Ashkenazi Jews typically have a higher risk. And if your mother or what your family tree is in that tree will depend on the, what your risk also is. So if you have no family as your breast cancer and you're 88 years old and you're getting a diagnosis of breast cancer and your estrogen progesterone receptor positive or two negative, the likelihood of this being a BRCA positive breast cancer is pretty low. And it's probably not advised to do the genetic counseling or testing. If you are a 22 year old with a triple negative breast cancer and whose mother had breast cancer and her uncle had prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer and she's from Ashkenazi origin, she definitely should be tested. So those are sort of the two extremes. And there's a lot of gray in between that obviously, but that's the two extremes. A young person with a very aggressive tumor and a very strong family history, and an older person who typically has no family history. Do you see many patients that are triple negative that do not have a mutation? Yes. So the mutations are not as common as everyone thinks it is. Because, you know, when you hear them, they think, you think, you know, 50% have these mutations, but it's really about 5%. It's a very small sub select patients that have it, but you have to actually be aware and you have to test the patients for it. Just because you think they have it is meaningless. There's now called panel testing and more in-depth testing that they do not only BRCA testing, they do other genes that, so just because you don't have BRCA doesn't mean you can't have a NOx gene or a, you know, a different gene along the way that actually has a higher incidence of uh, breast cancer or ovarian cancer for that matter. Yes. Uh, why, if they already have cancer, do you have people to the BRCA test then? Excellent question. <laughs> that was a great question. So there are a few reasons why you do uh, genetic testing. Number one, it actually can influence the treatment of the patient. Because if you are a BRCA positive patient, that doesn't, and we're sort of getting off the topic, so that's great. Um, 
If you're BRCA a positive patient, there are some things that will influence your treatment. For instance, if a BRCA positive patient just had a lumpectomy and went home and went to live their life, their chance of getting both breast and ovarian cancer are probably between, call it 50 and 90 percent. So the risk of getting a second cancer, either a breast cancer, A, B, getting ovarian cancer, are very high. So we typically advise patients to test depending on their age and where they are in their family rearing years, meaning if they're young, is to consider bilateral mastectomies as opposed to just a lumpectomy, and to consider an oophorectomy, meaning removing the ovaries if you're BRCA positive. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is if we don't identify patients who are BRCA positive, then we can't make these family trees and really link from one family to the next uh, who is a carrier for this for future generations. But then you never know who's who. So in order to get a little organized here, if you establish someone is BRCA positive, and then you can start following their descendants a little carefully and start screening them, usually it's 10 years before the index case, and you can start screening them earlier to prevent their cancer from ever occurring in the first place. So there's a multitude of reasons why you want to test, even though you know they already were diagnosed with cancer, but you want to prevent their children from having cancer, A, and B, their treatment will also be impacted based on whether they're BRCA positive or negative. For instance, the drugs, we're not up to that slide yet, the drugs that are given for BRCA positive metastatic breast cancer didn't exist five years ago or 10 years ago, actually five years ago. So now there are treatments that are being targeted against that gene or related to that gene that can actually influence their quality of life and their care. So there are a few reasons to test for BRCA gene. Not just BRCA specific, to have genetic testing and screening because there are plenty of genes out there, unfortunately, that we test for patients and we say, okay, this, this is gene called X or Y that has what's called a variable significance. We're not sure if it's in, it has an influence on the cancer or not at this point. And that goes into a data bank and so we can report out to the patients after following for years whether this was a gene that has any impact on their on, on, on their disease. In addition to that, the truth is, is that if we don't diagnose these patients, I had a patient who in the 80s had bladder cancer, in the 90s she had colorectal cancer, in 2000 she came to see me in the early 2000s. And she thought it was an isolated incident. She actually had what's called HMPCC, which is hereditary non pulposus coli, which is a familial colorectal cancer. But no doctor, she saw a new doctor every couple of years, but no doctor could actually put it together. But by diagnosing her with this, we could treat her, but not only that, we found out her daughters both have this gene, and then we could prophylactically get colonoscopies and the appropriate testing early time, so we actually detected this, these diseases earlier. So, do you find insurance company are discriminating against these people? So I find insurance companies to discriminate against everybody. You're <laughs> <laughs> not going to get a car anywhere that you an insurance company. <laughs> but the answer is no, they shouldn't. But I can't say what they really do. I don't really trust them. Okay, any other questions? Yes. On your chart that you had, um, is it chemotherapy, but is it also radiation on all of those types of... I was only, so I'm a medical oncologist, sorry. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be discussing radiation therapy. Radiation therapy for metastatic breast cancer is only given in what we call the palliative setting, meaning to prevent pain or suffering. If someone's having hip pain and there's a, there's a tumor there that's pushing on the bone, the radiation oncologist will treat that to make sure the pain is better. But for, for metastatic disease, meaning once again, disease that has spread beyond the breast, typically radiation, I say typically, it's not offered. That doesn't mean it won't be offered or it can't be offered. Typically, it's not offered. As opposed to in earlier stage breast cancer, it is always offered because we're trying to sort of Treat that area only. So it's a local therapy, it's not a systemic therapy. Okay, it just wasn't on the chart, so I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't make the chart, but I'll talk to the person who did <laughs> this question. All right.
So tamoxifen and tamoxifen or forestrons, these are what's called SERs, which are selective estrogen receptor modulators. Actually, uh, roloxifen is another SERM. If people actually take roloxifen to promote density issues. And then there are aromatase inhibitors. These are the drugs like anastrozole, extramuscane, letrozole, primera, aromas, and aromatex. And these are <clears throat> a little more selective, and there's a big difference in terms of the side effect profile for Edwards on these medications between these two drugs. So for instance, tamoxifen has a high propensity to cause hot flashes. There's a risk of uterine cancers related to it. We need an eye exam on a yearly basis related to tamoxifen. It actually helps bone density, not decrease bone density, but increases bone density. As opposed to the aromatase inhibitors, which are typically given to either postmenopausal females or patients who are premenopausal but are being blocked by either injection or other mechanisms of their function. Um, these are medications that actually typically cause bone loss, and they also can cause joint aches and pain. That's the most typical complaint for them. And boy, do they cause sometimes pretty significant bone aches and pains to the point that patients need to stop them. So if anyone has been on these medications or has friends on these medications and they say, oh, my aches really bother, you know, my bones really bother me, it's likely this medication that's causing it. Question. Yes. No, so, so the data on letrozole is actually, there are two studies. One is either five years of letrozole, or actually after five years of tamoxifen, two years of letrozole. That's really the data on letrozole. The, the data on aromatase inhibitors are really up, only up to five years. There are people that do five years of tamoxifen and five years of an aromatase inhibitor. This is specifically, I'm talking about in the adjuvant setting once again, meaning early stage breast cancer for everyone not to get confused with the topic that we're talking tonight of metastatic, meaning that spread beyond the breast cancer. That's a different duration. So in early stage breast cancer, we have data of 10 years of tamoxifen right now. We have data with five years of aromatase inhibitor. We have data up to seven years with a combination of the two, and also up to 10 years sometimes with a combination of the two. But the truth is there's gonna be more and more data that's coming out, because if you look at what's called a meta-analysis, of patients who have early stage breast cancer and they follow these patients for 10 to 15 years, there is a, unfortunately, a percentage of patients, and I think the number is up to 10% that can have a recurrence. So there's now data and research that's studying whether we should be extending those patients out longer and to what is really verified as longer. There's, there's a lot of people that do things, but there's not a lot of studies sometimes that back up right now. I'm being very careful because right now, those studies don't always exist. Those studies are gonna start showing up. But in order to do a 10 to 15 year study, you have to understand, that's a tremendous, so I was at uh, my, Miami Breast Conference. Every year my office makes me go to Miami in February. Every day that I fly down the middle of the snow. And uh, we have to stay at the Thousand Blue, which is really terrible. Terrible. It's such a hard place to sleep. Um, but at the Miami Press Conference, they presented this data, and the truth is, is that some people are extending out longer, but the data really um, isn't there. But these studies, it's very hard to do a 15-year follow-up study, because A, unfortunately, I think the the key researcher died in the middle of the study. If you understand that you're following a patient for 15 years and the guy in charge of the study, the, the principal investigator could be in his mid to late 60s, 15 years later, he's in his 80s. So and it's hard to follow patients 15 years because everyone looks at their own families and their own lives, people move around. And you lose pa patients and you lose the nurses that are following those patients. So it's a hard study to do to follow up patients for 10 to 15 years. But truthfully, we gain a tremendous amount of data because I see patients who had breast cancer 10 years ago. Today I saw two patients who I'm treating now who 10 years ago had breast cancer. They said, oh, they needed an oncologist, so they came to my office one day, and unfortunately their cancer had recurred. That's pretty devastating for a patient who thinks they're all done with this, and it's probably worse than their initial diagnosis, I would take it, because 
here it is back 10 to 15 years later, and they thought they were in the clear. So anyway, there are studies extending these pills out longer who are estrogen receptor positive, early stage breast cancer, for that exact reason, to actually try to see if we can shift that, not to 10 to 15 years at the current risk, but even 15 to 20, 30 years later. And then, I don't know how we're gonna study that, but at least to move that curve a little over on that way. Okay, so another medication uh, that is used, which is a selective ed estrogen down reg regulator, it's similar to tamoxifen. It's called Fosfodex or Fovestrin. This is a very unique medication. The only problem with it is that it requires injections, which are painful, uh, because it's given in a very syrupy, uh, it, the diluent meaning the, the medicine sits in a very syrupy solution in order to provide it to the patient, it has to be given an injection for it. But it's a very effective medication. And then the LHRH agonist, antagonist, which is Zolodex and Lupron, which are the blockers of uh, patients. So if, we're, if you have a premenopausal female who you want to, in essence, make postmenopausal, you just want to use an aromatase inhibitor to treat metastatic breast cancer, you use these medications to block their periods and their hormones in order to actually, in essence, fool the body to think of them from premenopausal to postmenopausal. Okay, so we talked about hormone status. Uh, we talked a little about side effects. Obviously, you'll be discussing with your doctor past hormonal treatments and menopausal status does play a role in the pre or post menopausal. <coughs> okay, we're going to stop before we get chemotherapy. Anyone else has questions? Is the tamoxifen as effective as the Rimadex and Eurosin? So that's a loaded question because in Europe, the truth is that they actually prefer tamoxifen for cost effectiveness. Meaning if you take dollar for dollar, tamoxifen is a very effective drug. Um, where I train at Fox Chase, actually B. Craig Jordan was the inventor of tamoxifen. And if you look at the history of tamoxifen, it's so intriguing. They gave it to patients who are elderly patients in nursing homes in England that they had breast masses and they didn't know what to do with them. So they just popped them on a pill called tamoxifen and they saw these breast masses shrink away. So that's really how, I mean, I'm sure a pharmaceutical company picked it up pretty quickly, but that's how tamoxifen sort of, it's actually the first targeted therapy because tamoxifen is truly targeting the estrogen receptor. So it's really a unique drug because it's targeting the estrogen receptor to slow down the cycle of the cancer. So tamoxifen is a very effective drug. The other drugs, aromatase inhibitors, like aromasin, arimidex, as oncologists, we feel that sort of that's like the second generation or the next generation of medications, and perhaps a little better, but we're splitting hairs in terms of how much better it is. And in terms of, if you look at the studies, they are a little better. They are not dramatically better in terms of their survival curves. But certainly, you know, if we could have one or two more patients live because they were on this pill over that pill, that's what a ribbon X and Robeson probably afford the patient. But sometimes that is at the cost of side effects. And those side effects could be severe joint aches. You know, I start typically my postmenopausal patients on the aromatase inhibitors. And then if they get bad side effects, I actually flip them to tamoxifen. And a lot of patients say, you know what? Why don't you start with tamoxifen initially? Exactly. I was doing so uh, this is so much better for me. Exactly. And I said, well, you know, we try to we try to give you the best drug that we feel is the best drug at that time, and then we move to a drug that you can tolerate if you can't tolerate the normal patient What is the um, problem in tamoxifen with the eyes? You mentioned something that can cause. There's, there could be some retinal issues related to the eyes. Therefore, they should have an eye exam, just a simple ophthalmological exam once a year. I'm just to understand are you saying that this medicine is a tie of the estrogen that naturally is produced, so it doesn't um, continue to enlarge the tumors? Or yeah, the the estrogen inhibitors. Is it, does it um, inhibit the natural estrogen that is produced? It blocks the, it's an estrogen receptor blocker, correct. So and aromatase inhibitors block actually a hormone called aromasin, which um, and the endocrinological feed loops are really blocking estrogen. So these are both, you know, patients will say, I'm gonna put you on an estrogen medication and they hear tamoxifen, 
you're not giving tamoxifen to feed the estrogen, you're giving it to block the estrogen. So they are actually estrogen receptor blockers. Like estrogen that's produced from the woman's body. Correct. In Naturally. So people don't know this, but you know, just because you're postmenopausal <coughs> doesn't make you stop producing estrogen. You have adrenal glands, you have fat cells that actually produce estrogen. That's what keeps people feminine, feminine stuff. They don't typically grow beards when they become postmenopausal because your body is in balance and still producing estrogen. So this is down-regulated block the estrogen in your system. You don't like that answer? No. <laughs> okay. But it's not really a genetic strategy, but do you think that women that are taking So, you know, the truth is that if someone is estrogen receptor positive and there are oral contraceptives or hormone replacement therapies, we tell patients to stop those medications. And the reason for it is that in theory, you are feeding or promoting the estrogen in the body and thereby if it's an estrogen receptor fed disease, you're not helping the situation. The analogous situation is to males that have prostate cancer. What do we do for men with prostate cancer? We block the testosterone. And by blocking the testosterone, thereby we downregulate the tumor. So when you block the estrogen, you downregulate the tumor. You block testosterone, you also downregulate the tumor. So we do not promote or we do not tell patients, you know, if you're estrogen receptor positive, to continue taking oral contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy. But does those contraceptives, are they actually, can they be more um, a risk factor? They could, yeah. Just, you know, we just have such a large population of women getting breast cancer, like, out of like hundreds of thousands of cases every year. This is true. And I'm just wondering if it's related to water. Just it could be. And that's why if you look at the, if you look at the old oral contraceptives versus today's oral contraceptives, the dose and the balance between estrogen or estradiol and progesterone, the the amount that they put in it is less and less, as opposed to years ago, the dose was much higher. So they were constantly sort of lowering that dose of the estrogen in the system in, in those pills itself. But they have an inherent risk, and most gynecologists will tell the patients, there's a risk of you having this promoting breast cancer, there's a risk of this actually promoting thrombosis or blood clots, there's, there's a risk of causing you know a multitude of problems with these medications. So no medication. I mean, today a patient told me that their blood pressure pill causes cancer and then their, their reflux pill causes cancer. And then asked me what to do. I said, stop taking your pills. <laughs> you know, the, every pill has this risk. You know, months ago or years ago, the Valsartan had a risk of, you know, causing cancer also. This was through a Chinese factory. So every medication has its risk and benefits and everyone has to make that assessment of whether it's worth it for a All right, so now we're gonna move on to uh, chemotherapy. So the anthracyclines is a class of drugs called adriamycin if you have, or someone you know has, adjuvant breast cancer, meaning early stage breast cancer, they typically will or can get a drug called adriamycin. <laughs> That's otherwise known as the red devil. devil. Come on. <laughs> Doxel um, is actually a liposomal form of this medication. It's given actually instead of every, uh, this is given every two to three weeks. This is actually given once a month. And Ellens, which is really, uh, I don't use Ellens, uh, but people are actually in the Southwest use it for the MD Anderson in that area. Typically all the trials are based on Ellens, which in theory has less side effects. So anthracycline is the biggest side effect are two main things, one is the risk of leukemia, and two is the risk of cardiac issues, meaning ejection fraction or heart failure issues. So typically, before anyone starts an anthracycline, they get what's called an echocardiogram or a mug scan, something for the heart, to make sure that the heart is pumping or is functioning adequately. <coughs> the next class of drugs we're going to talk about is Paxate, and this is a list of drugs, what is called Paxotir, which is given either every three weeks, Paxol, which can be given every week. Um, albumin paxotaxel or a braxing, which is similar to taxol, but just given a little different mechanism of delivery. 
Uh, then there are the platinum, which is the cis platinum and carbo platinum, which actually has an interesting history because carbo platinum was never in the past given for chemotherapy, and typically now the regimen for patients who are hurting and positive breast cancer, early stage breast cancer, get a regimen called TCHP, which is carbo platinum. And patients who are triple negative breast cancer, the data to support giving patients a platinum because they respond better, and patients who are uh, BRCA positive also typically respond to platinum for platinum metals much better. So that's an important point to say about chemotherapy. Then the anti-metabolism drug called 5-FU. The LODA is the oral form of 5-FU, so these are two cousins. The regimen for 5-FU you might have heard of is called CMF, which is actually the first chemotherapy regimen, reg regimen by Valadana in the early 70s. And then, and then gemcitabine, uh, which is another IV chemotherapy. These are other microtubule inhibitors. All these cause the main side effects of these medications is something called neuropathy, which is halibut, and zephyr, and navalpine. So issues with chemotherapy. Some patients get either single doses of chemotherapy, meaning one drug at a time. Others can get a combination of chemotherapy. So the advantage of giving a single chemotherapy is fewer toxicities. The advantage of a double, meaning two, drugs at the same time is greater chance of response. So if you have a patient who's doing very poorly and you need a more rapid response and they're not eligible for any other thing, giving a combination of chemotherapies is usually the correct preference. As opposed to patients who are stable, feeling good, and don't need a lot of side effects, but you want a response, a single agent is usually the preferred regimen. There are oral agents, the LODA is my preferred oral agent. It's easy to take. Sometimes it has some side effects like diarrhea, it's something called hand foot syndrome, which is burning the hands and feet. Uh, cost plays a role in the chemotherapy and side effect management of all these drugs. So for instance, when you're debating a chemotherapy, sometimes the important things are what causes hair loss for a patient, because if they want to maintain their hair, who doesn't? Uh, but for quality of life purposes, as opposed to putting on a wig, Sometimes you will choose one chemotherapy which has equal as, as, as efficacious as another, but you want to make sure that patients tolerate it well. We're going to now talk about targeted therapies. And truthfully, this has revolutionized chemotherapies. When the adjuvant and perception came about, you know, patients who are HER2 positive, metastatic disease, and breast cancer, if they're HER2 positive, you don't know what's really going to happen. Patients but actually, I have a, a superstar patient who, when they first got her scan, no one could believe she had breast cancer, and now she's 10 years out with metastatic breast cancer. She, the company flew her out, uh, Genetech, flew her out to the offices in San Francisco just to show her around because they were just amazed at how well she's doing. Her first CAT scan was the worst CAT scan that I've ever seen in my career. It looked like there wasn't a spot that didn't have disease, I would say. It was all, when you look at a test scan, anything bright is bad. The whole sheet was bright. Like, it just, she had no liver function, no, nothing. And this is 10 years later. I know that was her birthday party it was a few weeks ago. <laughs> So these are the drugs we use, Regeta and Herceptin. Typically, we use those in combinations. These are the uh, Herceptin, um, it's called them copycats. They're all similar um, to Herceptin itself. There's an oral medication called Lepacinib, which is called Tyker. Ketsyla is actually the newest chemotherapy on the block uh, for targeted therapy. Ketsyla is actually a very effective drug for patients who have failed. Her, uh, receptin and Pergetta. Um, and now it's actually FDA approved for patients who get what's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which is a term I didn't use before. So a person presents with breast cancer who is HER2 positive, sometimes they get chemotherapy for the surgery and then get surgery, and then following surgery, whether they have what's called residual disease or any cancer left, they'll determine whether they get a drug called Casilo. Is an in mTOR inhibitor. These are the PARP inhibitors that we talked about for patients who are BRCA positive, Linparza and Calzenda. 
And these are the CDK inhibitors. There's Piscali, Ibrahim, the Virginia Oh, I left out Piscali before. My apologies to the Vardis. Um, but these are the three CDK inhibitors that are usually given in conjunction with an aromatase inhibitor. So important issues are her new status, target drugs, knowing your biomarkers. There's one biomarker we did not leave on this thing. It's um, called PICRAE, which is a uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor, which is for patients who actually are ER positive who have failed the CDK inhibitors. Um, so if you, if you have a CDK inhibitor called Virginia and you have progression disease, your oncologist should test you for a PI3 kinase inhibitor uh, for PICRAE. And this is finally immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is used almost for every cancer that I know of right now. It's almost like it takes no imagination to give immunotherapy. But in breast cancer, we've been pretty slow to adopt it because the trials have been not as convincing as, for instance, in lung cancer, melanoma, Hodgkin's disease, bladder cancer, some prostate cancers, some cervical cancer, some Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's disease. So the first and only FDA approved drug is called Cetric, which is called a Tidoloma. Uh, it's given in combination with a Braxane for triple negative breast cancer in a metastatic setting. So someone has this, um, this is given together with the Braxane. It's the first metastatic breast cancer therapy approved for in immunotherapy. Um, and the biomarker that must be done is called PDL1. So if you're PDL1 positive, this is the drug that you can get. If you're PDL1 negative, it's not going to be paid through the three year insurance company. Do they only test PDL1 once you're metastatic? Yes. There's no point in testing it earlier. This is no drug to give earlier. So typically, PDL1 is tested only when you become placebo. And clinical trials is something that we continue to do and grow our database at Monmouth Medical Center and also at the Southern Hospitals Community and uh, Monmouth South. Um, we actually are combining uh, with uh, Rutgers right now on a uh, immunotherapy. Well, if you start an immunotherapy drug, it's called a Parker trial. That if patients get on immunotherapy, we draw four times their blood at different times of immunotherapy to test different markers throughout the therapy. And patients get a $50 gift card every time they get their blood drawn. Oh, wow. So that's 200 bucks just for being on a trial. Yeah. <laughs> are these done with the therapy alongside? Or is the clinical trials are typically D-therapy, not along with the therapy. Yeah. So depending on the clinical trial, so there could be clinical trials that are along with the therapy, like that blood testing. You can go on that trial whether you're on any drug, as long as you're on any therapy. Um, and sometimes they're the only drug you can be on. I mean, you can't be on any other medication other than the clinical trial drugs. Depends on what the how the clinical trial is set up. So side effects can get very tricky. The most important thing I would tell every one of my patients is that you have to tell your doctor if you're having a side effect. Telling nobody does not help you. So you have to be proactive and let the doctor know what the side effect is. Sometimes the side effect can be addressed appropriately, and sometimes you can't do much about it other than saying, you know, let's try to manage it. And try to work with it as best as you can. Hair loss is obviously a common one and really for, you know, appearances, that's the most significant that people know that someone is on chemotherapy. It's fatigue, insomnia, with edema, neuropathy based on the medication, hot flashes, sexual side effects and dysfunction. Cognitive effects are very common uh, for patients on chemotherapy and also after they're done with chemotherapy cognitive effects can continue. Immunotherapies have also their unique side effects. I actually tell my patients if they're on immunotherapy, you think of the itises. They've got gastroenteritis, hepatitis, nephritis, which is kidney problems, pneumonitis, or thyroiditis. So they can, immunotherapies can affect any part of the body and actually can have pretty significant side effects. You have to pay attention to the side effects of chemotherapy. So they can cause diarrhea, eye problems, breathing problems, headaches, blood pressure, chest pain, urination problems, fevers. You know, we can really run the gamut. You name any side effect, and I can tell you that 
That can be the chemotherapy or the immunotherapy that's causing it. Palliative therapy, this as a note, is not the same as hospice. It's giving supportive care, but the truth is we should be doing that all along when a patient has metastatic breast cancer to support them in every which way possible. Sometimes surgery is given for palliative care. As I mentioned before, radiation therapy sometimes is given for uh, palliative care. Uh, bone loss is the significant side effect related to the uh, bone case inhibitors, and that's why we offer bone density scans or DEXA scans for our patients. And there are medications that we use, called Dometa and Exchiva, which are injections or shots, uh, or infusions, I should say, in shots, to slow down the risk of uh, bone mineral loss. And also it helps sometimes with bone pain and calcium um, balance. So any questions up to now? Yes. So right now, the only FDA-approved therapy for immunotherapy in breast cancer is triple negative breast cancer. That means ER, PR, first immune negative breast cancer that is metastatic is the only FDA-approved medication for patients for immunotherapy. So there's no other, and that's given in combination with the drug called Abraxin. So that's the only right now indication that we have for immunotherapy in breast cancer. So triple negative metastatic breast cancer. So you have a clinical trial. Do you give a placebo or do you get some type of treatment for your cancer? No, so these clinical trials would be unethical to give a placebo. And so I always tell my patients they can go anywhere they want, they can see anyone they want. But if they're getting a clinical trial, I would always like to view what clinical trial they're going on because sometimes these clinical trials are really for the cancer center for the patient on the trial that they need X amount of numbers. I hate to say that, but that's the reality of sometimes what patients and doctors need to do. Other times they're excellent clinical trials, but no trial in a person with metastatic breast cancer should be a placebo versus drug trial. That would be unethical in my mind because that would not allow or for the patient to get actually any treatment when they actually obviously need treatment. So that should never be offered to a patient, and if it is offered, then you should go to another place. Are the doses on MPR There, there is. Okay. I'm not sure why there is. But there is. So I was actually alluding into a little before, if you heard me. Right. The drug called epirubicin is used for some reason by like Texas Oncology Group and MD Anderson. I'm not sure why, or in LA, as opposed to in the East Coast, we, the last time we used epirubicin was 15 years ago. So a lot has to do with the training, and typically I would say, you know, if you're trained in the East Coast, you're gonna probably live in the East Coast. You're not gonna to move to the West Coast, maybe you will, but typically patient, you know, doctors stay on their side of whatever line that is, let's call it the Mississippi. Um, <laughs> it must be some historical term, before 40 or fight. Uh, but typically doctors stay close to their training bases, so, for instance, in some places they will use certain drugs if that's the way they train for whatever reason that's with clinical trials. But as a whole, as an aggregate, there's not a huge difference between epirubicin and doxol or adriamycin in terms of they're all anthracyclic. People thought epirubicin has less cardiac toxicity, but in fact, the truth is it really doesn't have much difference in terms of toxicity issues. So there are always geographic variations in treatments. But as a whole, there's no like, you can't say that in this area, survival is up 5% they use this drug, and in this other area, they use a different drug. Pertaining to like bone density loss and the bone mass, do you suggest that people that have those issues take vitamin D and calcium supplements on a regular basis? So calcium vitamin D is a whole different topic of sort of supportive drugs, not chemotherapeutic drugs, but I try to test most of my patients, if not all my patients, with vitamin D levels twice a year, but I try to keep them above a 30, giving a 30, a level of 30 micrograms per deciliter. 
So if you keep them above 30, like the Society of Endocrinology, you can, if they're below that, you give them either 4,000 of vitamin D, 2,000 a day vitamin D, or even 50,000 a week of vitamin D. Some people go much higher than that if they're into dosing and go crazy. But I think vitamin D is important for not only bone loss, but there is data to support getting vitamin D in terms of risk of metastatic disease and reducing the risk of metastatic disease. So, um, for instance, exercise and vitamin D are two simple things a patient can do without really doing anything that actually can reduce the risk of breast cancer recurrence if you have localized disease. Um, what's the vitamin D level of CBC and all that? Right, so most patients won't know they're getting a vitamin D tested unless they, either the doctor orders it routinely or the patient says, could you check for my vitamin D level? But if their blood is drawn, Typically, when they have a chemistry profile, that can be added to the chemistry profile. So they don't need an additional stick for blood. If you're taking the estrogen blocker medication, um, are we not getting any estrogen at all? No, you are. Oh, we are. You still, it's not a complete blockade. Because, once again, what makes a person feminine, even though they're blocking estrogen, they're still, you know, so estrogen is still being secreted by that to a lesser level and it's down regulating estrogen in your body. So the level of estrogen is about the same. The problem is there's no way to quantify that. You know, there's no like blood test to see how much estrogen truly is based on whether you're taking aromatase or not. <laughs> yes, I'm glad the back table raised your hand. That's good. <laughs> question was, does estrogen block, the, the estrogen blockers, like the aromatase inhibitors, decrease all estrogen in the body? The answer is typically not. It downregulates the estrogen. It doesn't, it decreases the estrogen, doesn't block it in total. There's still estrogen in the system, but just to feel less of the Yes. <laughs> I have a deep question. What? I, I've just taken out my own 3,000 and Good. So, do I do a really bad thing, or I know it was less than 30. You did not do a bad thing. We'll talk later. <laughs> no. <laughs> you did not do a bad thing. It's okay. You're fine. <laughs> So you should share with table three. <laughs> That's great. So it doesn't mean stop, but you can lower the dose depending on what dose you're on. And you don't have, you're not going for the gold medal of life and peace here. And you don't go for 100. You want to try to keep it? You could stop it and uh, you could repeat it in a few months and see where it is at that point as well. What is a perplexia if I can get a uh, test that said it's negative of my other price? What is a perplexia testing for the bones of your body? Uh, what's the term? It, well, it's a perplexia. It's how that can be done. Pre-cancerous Oh, you mean dysplasia? Dysplasia. That's free. That's not cancer. Right. Free. So what do we do about that? You have follow-up mammograms. Uh, that's on a biopsy? Yes, a biopsy. So there's no real treatment for that. Obviously, you just need close follow-up. Whoever sends you to the test. Do you need another surgery to see what the problem is? Well, I don't, so I don't know the exact case. I, I don't see the pathology just because it says display. I'm not sure. Yeah, but two years ago, they did a uh, OK, I'm, I'm not biopsy. sure. I would just make sure with your surgeon or the person who did the biopsy to confirm that there's nothing else going on. All right, any other questions? So I hope uh, some some of you have learned something tonight. I know I had fun. <laughs> uh, but um, I hope this is a useful 
uh, lecture and hope uh, some of you have gained something from the lecture. And I really want to encourage everyone, if either themselves or their family members, to really not only be supportive for them, but also ask them to prod and make sure their doctor is really addressing their needs and going out of their way to really help them as best they can. Yes? Um, which is the most common place, where is the most common place that um, breast cancer will metastasize to? Is it to bone? So typically I would say to put it in order and rank it. Bone is number one, uh, lung, liver, you know, adrenals. So it typically doesn't go much beyond the liver, you know, in the pelvic area. Um, so bone, liver, lung, sometimes thyroid, and it can spread to the brain, unfortunately. So when you say that different patients are, um, you know, they respond differently when they have metastatic breast cancer, isn't it somehow related to where it has metastasized? Is that about Typically it? not. The genetics of the disease that really protects and predicts the prognosis more than it, where it's spread to. So you can have a patient who's spread everywhere and have an amazing response because the genetics of the disease is such that whatever drug you pick sort of matches the genetics of the disease to block it. And you can have a patient with very minimal disease that just doesn't respond as well because it's refractory, meaning it's, it's not responsive to therapy. So where it spreads doesn't pretend to prognosis as much as what the genetics of the disease is and how that will respond to the therapy. When you say the genetic of the disease, are you talking about the percentage? Or just the I'm talking about all the genetics of the disease. So ER, PR is part of it, herpenu is part of it. You could actually run what's called foundation medicine or what's called garden health, which is a liquid genomic biopsy to run PI3 kinase inhibitors, you know, Really, any any inhibition or any targeted therapy can be. You can sequence basically the whole gene of the cancer to see what targeted therapies are available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.